Elizabeth, a Pride and Prejudice novella, written by Christy Capps, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. 1. My unsociable cousin Fitzwilliam Darcy has finally fallen head over heels in love, Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam teased. Can this be possible? The journey from Darcy's house in London to his aunt's estate in Kent had seemed the perfect opportunity to catch up with Richard. At the Colonel's sudden change of conversation, Darcy immediately revised his thinking. It had not been such a good idea after all. Who has finally found the key to unlock the three-inch thick, icy enclosure around your heart? Richard reached across the carriage and jabbed him in the arm. Darcy, the younger of the two by two short years, scoffed. You know nothing. Ha! As a decorated war hero, I am exceedingly competent in ferreting out minute details and deciphering clues until mysteries are revealed in their entirety. Of what are you speaking, Richard? Darcy chuckled. I sincerely doubt being gifted a ribbon by the daughter of your general, the youngest child not yet out of the nursery, I believe, would hardly qualify as being decorated. And hero, you? Smirking, the colonel gazed out the carriage window, as, with each turn of the wheel, it rocked closer to their aunt's estate of Rosings Park. It was his turn to snort. I will have you know that I have been accurately accused of heroics since I was in leading strings. By your father, not by your commanding officer, Darcy interjected. Be that as it may, cousin, you are wandering far from the point. Richard's eyes were now directly upon him. The colonel continued. You cannot deny the long sighs. Far-off looks and building tension in a man are evidences of distress. Either he is heading to the battlefront, thinking of the family he's leaving behind, or meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes, in the face of a pretty woman, can bring each morning when he wakes to find her tucked tightly next to him. Richard. For the first time since they left London, Darcy was unsettled. He had used that exact phrasing when he had been speaking privately with Miss Caroline Bingley while attending a gathering at the home of Sir William Lucas in Meryton, Hertfordshire. Hearing his specific verbiage, spouted by his cousin, confounded him. How could the man possibly know? The colonel had not been at Lucas Lodge that evening. Nor, in fact, had he been to Hertfordshire in the recent past. Richard had returned from fighting on the continent only three weeks prior, after having been gone from England's shores for the past ten months. By chance, have you spoken recently with Miss Bingley? To have quoted him perfectly, Richard had to have spoken directly with Caroline Bingley. When, where, and how? The stomach acids in his gut churned, at the thought Bingley's sister had shared Darcy's private conversation. He had no idea the two individuals were acquainted. Richard's nose wrinkled as his brows came together to a point where they almost touched. Bingley's unwed sister? No, I've not. Colonel Fitzwilliam's eyes opened wide as his mouth dropped open. Pray, tell me she is not the object of your regard, Darcy, or I will have you shipped off to Bedlam for your own protection. Have you lost your mind? Briskly shaking his head, Darcy quickly reassured the other man. Never, he shuddered. By your intent to send me to an asylum at the idea of attaching myself to her, I am given to understand you also do not find her a worthy candidate for your hand in marriage. Never. Richard shuddered in turn. Darcy was relieved to hear his cousin's firm reply. As a second son of an earl and a career military man, Richard needed to look to a woman's dowry before selecting a bride. Miss Bingley came with twenty thousand, a considerable sum that could draw the attention of a potential husband where her lack of connections and poor attitude would not. Richard narrowed his eyes. Why did you mention her if you have no desire to make her Mrs. Darcy? Your comment about fine eyes was one I happened to make to Caroline Bingley recently. I merely wondered if she had mentioned my distraction to you. Distraction? Who distracted you, if not her? The colonel was quick to ask. Did I specify it was a woman who distracted me? Darcy had to watch himself. His cousin was clever. 
And before I will answer, you must recall how my father often says the same of my mother when he is attempting to restore himself to her good graces. He makes sure she overhears him claim he had been meditating upon her fine eyes, when the reality is he was thinking of a bill before the House of Lords, or wondering when his favourite nephew, Richard pointed at him, will be taking a bride. Ah, you are correct. Relieved he had not been overheard, he recalled, I have heard Uncle Malcolm say those exact words to Aunt Helen. Mystery solved. It seems to work. Perhaps I should use them the next time I'm in ill favour with the woman of my dreams. Richard teased. Who would absolutely not be Caroline Bingley? Darcy nodded. Miss Bingley was not the woman of his dreams either. Then let me state again with clarity so there is no confusion. I will not take Miss Bingley for my wife. Ever. Blast it, Darcy. If not her, thank the good Lord, by the by. He would have crossed himself had he been Catholic. Then who has captured your heart? For I am now convinced someone has. Darcy snickered. He loved nothing more than to perplex his cousin. I shall not say a word. Of course you will not. Richard crossed his arms and slid down in the seat, accidentally kicking Darcy's polished hessians with his own. Grumbling, he admitted, "'You do not deny my charge, my man. You have found a pleasing woman, and I demand to know who you plan to bring into your home. After all, do I not share guardianship of your sister? Should I not learn whom you will inflict upon my ward to guide her through her presentation and debut?' Nodding, Darcy agreed in theory with his cousin's suggestion. Additionally, he yearned to speak of his internal battle, resulting from disparate feelings about the young lady, for his cousin was indeed correct. Unexpectedly, an unmarried female had infiltrated his mind and heart, until he was almost paralysed at the thought of her. She invaded his sleep, the hours he had set aside for working on estate and investment issues, and the time he typically spent reading for pleasure. Closing his eyes briefly, he recalled her clearly, as if she was standing outside the carriage as they closely passed by. She had a propensity for walking, the exercise enhancing her fine looks. Her rich chestnut curls would have loosened from the knot she wore at the back of her neck. Her cheeks would be pinked from exertion as she strolled the pathways beyond the garden walls. Her eyes... Never had he observed the level of healthy vitality in a lady whose blue-grey orbs glistened with wise counsel, tender kindness, and mirth. Ultimately, each time he was in her company, he marvelled at her ability to draw his attention and engage his sensibilities. "'Who is she, Das? The colonel was persistent. No sooner were the words spoken than he slapped his hand to his forehead. "'Good God in heaven!' Please say you have not fallen for the latest diamond, Miss Millie Stafford. She may be the loveliest of the debutantes this season, but my mother, who has an eye out for daughter-in-law candidates, calls her silly Millie for a reason. Darcy lifted a brow. Her looks will fade with time, Darcy, and you will be left with a wife who incorrectly assumed Earl was my father's first name, rather than his position. What? Darcy was intrigued by this particular tidbit of information. She did what? I'm not speaking to humour you, Richard guffawed. We were at dinner with no less than seven families besides my own three evenings past, when she inquired of her host if anyone other than herself was confused by those who would address him by his name and title, the Right Honourable, the Earl, Earl Fitzwilliam. He gulped. I tell you. I and others had a cursed time containing our laughter, as father informed the lady his first name was not Earl, but Malcolm. Joined merriment flooded the interior of the coach. Wiping tears from the corners of his eyes, Darcy sighed. Inadvertently, Richard had hit upon one of the greatest sources of his frustrations. Since entering the marriage mart, he had been unable to avoid the insipid interchanges promoted by young ladies who had been trained to pander to a single man possessed of a large fortune in an attempt to entice him to the altar. You can rest assured your Miss Millie Stafford was as forgettable as the rest of the daughters of the Upper Ten Thousand. She was the season's diamond, 
He could not recall even a vague description of her appearance. You're not considering marrying Anne, are you? The colonel had reached forward to pluck the newspaper from Darcy's hand, his tone suddenly serious. I mean, I admire our cousin as much as you do, but she would never be a fitting mistress of Pemberley, nor could she guide Georgie in society, as she rarely travels to London and has never had her own season. Aunt Catherine keeps her securely under her control. I am not considering Anne. Darcy would not bend to his aunt's will to marry her daughter, establishing one of the largest land ownerships in all of England. Georgiana would require a woman with a compassionate heart who could not be swayed by the desires of a young sister. Anne would never do. Miss Georgiana Darcy had displayed poor judgment the past summer when she agreed to elope with the son of Pemberley's former steward, while the man, George Wickham, possessed the ability to charm the pants off... Well, he had convinced Darcy's own father that he was endowed with a character superior to the man's own son. Wickham had held the subterfuge for over a decade. How could an innocent, guileless child like Darcy's sister stand firm against such charm? Had Darcy not arrived at his sister's cottage in Ramsgate early, the deed would have been done. She would have been wed to a rogue before her sixteenth birthday. Their cousin Anne, the only child of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, had not the ability to confidently express her preferences for any aspect of her life. She had been sickly and frail since childhood. The idea of her setting a proper example for his sister was ludicrous. No, despite her mother's insistence that her daughter and Darcy wed, it would never happen. I am not, nor have I ever, considered Caroline Bingley, Millie Stafford or Anne to be my wife. Yet you have found someone, the colonel persisted. Richard Fitzwilliam, you are as stubborn in your course as my old donkey. I have no intention of sharing the contents of my heart with a man who would use the information to torment and tease. In a quick move, Darcy snagged the newspaper back from the colonel. Look, we are almost arrived. Gesturing out the window to a view of an approaching building, the bend in the road revealed the parsonage at Huntsford, inhabited by the ridiculous Mr Collins, whom he had met during his sojourn in Hertfordshire. Noting that spring had been generous with the foliage behind the fence of the parson's garden, Darcy was surprised to see a woman standing within its gates. Mr Collins, who stood beside her, must have married. Before Darcy could express his shock that a sycophantic fool had succeeded in claiming a woman as a bride, the lady turned. Rich chestnut curls fought for freedom from her confining bonnet. A light and pleasing countenance spun towards his carriage, as the parson pointed excitedly to Darcy's conveyance. Pain stabbed at his chest as her head tilted and her chin rose. To his chagrin, the very person who for the past months since he had retreated from Charles Bingley's leased estate in Hertfordshire had consumed him day and night had been snatched from his consideration by an idiot. Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Longbourn was now the mistress of Huntsford Parsonage, and would forevermore be addressed as Mrs. Collins. He wanted to vomit. 2. Relief like Darcy had never felt before surged through him when his aunt later revealed the parson and his wife had a guest, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Mr. Collins had indeed married a lady from Hertfordshire. Whom he had not married was Miss Elizabeth. As his aunt rambled on, covering inconsequential subjects of no interest to anyone other than herself, Darcy easily recalled the camaraderie between Mrs Collins, the former Charlotte Lucas, and her closest friend and neighbour. The new Mrs Collins had been the perfect foil to the second Bennet daughter. She had joined with Miss Elizabeth in attempting to regulate the three younger Bennet girls, while the eldest of five females, Miss Jane Bennet, had her own attention diverted by Bingley. Darcy abhorred the three youngest girls at the Bennet estate of Longbourn. Nevertheless, he recognised the virtues of the two older sisters and their friend. How Miss Lucas had come to marry a simpleton was a curiosity. Nevertheless, it had been done, and she was, he assumed, comfortably settled in Kent. At a ball held by Bingley the final evening they were in Hertfordshire, Miss Jane Bennet, with her classic looks and a calm demeanour, had quietly and pleasantly moved through company,
constantly seeking the comfort of others. Miss Elizabeth had done the same, although quiet and calm were words he would not immediately associate with her. Where Miss Bennet was the haze of daybreak, Miss Elizabeth was the brightest light of the sun. She radiated a zest for living, which attracted him at his most fundamental level. Until he had observed her, he had not been aware he lacked anything. Now, he was fully cognizant of the gaps in his daily life. Where he was quiet in company, she would easily infuse joy into a gathering without any need to extend himself to move beyond his own reticence. When he desired intelligent conversation with someone who would challenge him to improve, she had repeatedly proven herself up to the task. When he was lonely, which he hesitated to admit was the majority of the time, she would be the companion of his future life. When he... He was being ridiculous. Miss Elizabeth would do none of those things. At least, not for him. As Lady Catherine continued to expound about the need to remove aphids from the rose garden or some other subject upon which she had personally deemed herself expert, his mind went to the crux of the matter. Miss Elizabeth Bennet's family had ties to trade. Darcy was the grandson of an earl, one of the largest landowners in the kingdom, with a name going back to antiquity. The Bennet daughters had little dowry. Georgiana's portion was a fortune. The Bennets possessed a small estate, which was entailed to the main line, specifically Mr. Bennet's cousin, Mr. Collins. Darcy had a grand estate, a large house in town, several properties in Scotland, and a 10,000-acre parcel covered with tall timber, west of Boston in the Americas. Their situations were as different as night to day. Georgiana would need a sister whose family name enhanced her position in society, who could hold her own amongst those of elevated rank. Miss Elizabeth was a gentleman's daughter, with a mother lacking propriety. Even with changing attitudes amongst the peerage, she would be unacceptable as a wife to Darcy. She would be the object of scorn for reaching too high, for reaching above her sphere. No, he could never marry Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Could he? Crossing his legs, he cupped his chin in his hand as his elbow rested on the arm of the world's most uncomfortable chair. To a keen observer, he imagined he painted a picture of relaxed calm. Yet inside, he churned with the same conclusion holding him captive since he left Bingley's estate, Netherfield Park, the late autumn before. He could not marry Miss Elizabeth. Nevertheless, she was the only woman he wanted as his wife. What was he to do? Tell me about her, Richard quietly insisted. The household, including their aunt, had retired almost an hour before. Rosings Park was silent as the servants quietly moved about to close the house for the night. Who? Darcy aimed for innocence, in hopes his cousin could be diverted from commenting upon his earlier reaction to the first mention of Miss Elizabeth's name. Do not attempt to dissuade me, Darcy. When you recognised her outside the parsonage, every vestige of colour bled from your face. When Aunt Catherine stated the guest at the parsonage was Miss Bennet, your paleness fled as blood poured back until your cheeks were practically plum-coloured. Your hands quivered and your knee bounced. I've never seen you unsettled to this extent, my good man. Embarrassed beyond measure, Darcy refused to reply to his cousin's demand. Richard was correct. His body had betrayed his emotions. Rather than retaining his calm, his first response was to look about to see if anyone had noticed. He asked, Were you the only one to recognise my agitation? Agitation, was it? Richard snorted. I would call it what it was. He sipped his brandy and placed the glass on the table beside his chair, before continuing. Stop lying to yourself, Darcy, and to me. You are in love with Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Lying? I'm a man of honour, and you know I am. Rubbing his hands over his face, he stubbornly continued to deny the charge. How could he love a woman of inferior birth, a woman with a vulgar matchmaking mother, and sisters who were certain to bring shame to the Bennet family name, and his own, should he unwisely attach himself to her. Darcy, enough! Slumping down in his chair, Richard crossed his hands over his chest and waited. Fine. 
You want to know? I will tell you all. Darcy wanted to pace. Instead, he leaned his elbows on his knees and dropped his face into his hands. With the revelation would come despair, he had no doubt. His intense hope was that it would also bring clarity and purpose. In my lifetime, he began, I have desired to possess few things. Knowing my place in society, and as the future master of Pemberley, I cautiously considered the benefits or the trials of obtaining these desires. Yes, I have long considered you to be meticulously judicious in your choices, Richard agreed. In my memory, other than small mistakes inherent in imperfect men, there were three times I knowingly went against my better judgment. All three times I, or others, suffered needlessly. Richard's brow lifted. The first was when I was six. My mother told me I could have one apple tart. Unwisely, in my greed, I waited until her and Nanny's attention was diverted, and ate them all. His cousin groaned. So did he. My belly ached for days. Nonetheless, I had not yet learned my lesson. At the ripe age of twelve, a new stallion in the stable caught my eye. Ulysses, the colonel muttered. Yes, Ulysses. Darcy shook his head at the memory. He was as green as the grass, and as willful as I was. Father caught me in the barn enough times with Ulysses, he felt the need to demand I stay away. He clearly comprehended my interest. His warning had been stern. I, in the eternal optimism of youth, and believing in my own invincibility, refused to accept my limitations and father's restrictions. Thus I climbed up on the beast with nothing more than a bridle. I lasted less than ten seconds, although it felt like much longer once he started to move. That was the summer your mother would not let you out of her sight, correct? Richard asked. You could not come to Matlock, and we were forced to stay away from Pemberley. Yes, with my arm bound tight to keep the bone in place, I could not swim or climb or run about. They were the worst months of my entire youth, and I regretted both the injury and my parents' disappointment in me. And the third? Darcy sighed heavily. There were less than a handful of individuals who could bear testimony to this failure. I was in my final year of university. Rubbing his hands over his face, he sat back in the chair, his eyes staring unseeingly at the ceiling. Wickham had again locked me out of our room as he dallied with one of the servant girls from the inn where he gathered with his colleagues in crime. I went to my normal spot in the library where, instead of studying, which was my usual want, I penned a lengthy missive to my father, outlining all of the failures of his chosen ward and steward's son, George Wickham. You never gave it to your father? Richard asked. I did not. Rubbing the palms of his hands on his pants' legs, Darcy's chortle was mirthless. I was a fool. Standing, he began to walk back and forth, from one end of the room to the other. Finally, he resumed speaking, moving directly in front of his cousin. Since we were at Eton, I had known of Wickham's evil proclivities. Yet each time I considered revealing his sins to father, I consciously chose not to do so. I did not want to worry father. This time not doing so became my greatest regret. Four hours later, I woke to Wickham shaking me by the shoulder, my letter in his hands. He read it. Oh, yes, he read each and every word. Good God! his cousin said to himself. Before I could grab it from his hands, he was gone. Again, Darcy sat. Although I knew the man to be vile, I had no idea of the depths he would go. Before the day had passed, I received the news of my father's ill health. By the time I arrived at Pemberley, Wickham, who had run to him immediately after reading my letter, was already there. He had twisted the truths I had revealed. Additionally, he swore to my father it was me doing the dastardly deeds contained on each page. I returned home to an irate master, who threatened to disinherit and disown me. Oh, Lord! That is not the worst of it, Richard. Darcy inhaled deeply, then slowly released the air. Wickham waited for me in the hallway. As I stepped from my father's chambers, he reached behind me and closed the door, so father would not hear him brag of his victory. Were there no footmen about? Wickham had dismissed them all. Darcy sneered at the memory. 
I desperately wanted to challenge him for defiling me in my father's eyes, but he was not yet finished. Gulping, Darcy continued, his voice ragged. Despite Georgiana being barely ten years of age at the time, he taunted me with the claim that he would wait until the legal paperwork was completed by father to transfer the inheritance of Pemberley and our other estates from me to my sister. Then he would have father select him as her guardian until he could marry her. Therefore he would get what he always wanted, the position of Master of Pemberley. I am going to be sick. Richard dropped his head between his knees. Before my father's threats of disinheritance could become reality, before his man of business could be contacted, he died. Darcy scoffed. His final thoughts were of intense shame for the dishonourable son he had sired, and deep affection for his beloved ward, George Wickham. How I hate wicked Wickham. So, his motive for trying to elope with Georgie this summer, to make good on his claim, Darcy admitted. I have no doubt that had he succeeded with Georgiana, he would have found a means to eliminate me. Thus he could reign over my home, ruining it and the Darcy name at the same time. Mr. and Mrs. Wickham, along with their descendants, would become the new owners of Pemberley. I will run him through! Richard jumped from his chair, pumping his fist in the air. I will shoot him until he is dead and writhing upon the ground. I will beat him until his face is a pulp, and no one will ever be influenced by his so-called charm. I will do nothing. What? Darcy, you should want to join me, or at the least cheer me on. You will do nothing, Richard. Darcy was firm. I made the wrong choice when I was at university, but I will not do so again. Had I not penned that letter... My father would have died still holding me in esteem. To confront Wickham, to give credence to his taunts, would be to feed his ego, for he would see it as a victory. To kill him would be to destroy the man my father held in affection. I will not do this to my father's memory. Your reasoning is not sound, cousin. You cannot deny I can and I will. Emphatically, he pounded his fist on the wooden arm of the chair. My victory is in displaying no reaction to him, to allow him to believe I am unaffected by anything he says or does, to show him I have no fear of his machinations. But, no, enough of this. The colonel's eyes pierced his own. You are wrong, Darcy, wrong about the best course to follow for George Wickham, and I suspect wrong about the choice to not make Miss Elizabeth your bride. Without another word, Darcy stood, and walked from the room. 3. After a restless night, tossing and turning, Darcy discerned what he had to do. Thinking back to his final exchange with Miss Elizabeth in Hertfordshire, he realised Richard's concerns were valid. By not revealing Wickham's true character, he had left the people of Meryton susceptible. He had left Miss Elizabeth, who considered Wickham one of her favourites, vulnerable. This would not do. He was honourable and knew the value of duty, a man to whom an untruth was intolerable. Darcy recognised how not revealing Wickham's character was a lie by omission, allowing local citizenry to accept the rake at face value, as a charming man of means who had been irreparably harmed by none other than Darcy himself. Sour gall rose from his gut to his throat. He tasted the bitterness churning from his failings. How could he not have seen the error of his decision? Why had he remained stubborn? The amount of pain Wickham caused in his own household was monumental. Why had he not figured this out before? Georgiana still suffered heartache at what she had almost cost her family, in spite of almost ten months having passed, since she agreed to Wickham's proposal at Ramsgate. Her tender emotions had collapsed under the weight of the broken trust she had once cherished in a former childhood friend. Darcy had no doubt Miss Elizabeth's feelings would suffer as well. However, he knew her. First would come anger. He would feel the burn of her ire when he disclosed the details of Wickham's history with gentle ladyfolk as she comprehended being left defenceless and unprotected by Darcy, a man arrogantly proud of his title of gentleman. Then would come heartache, as a man she held to be of value would be revealed as disingenuous.' 
Darcy decided to walk to the parsonage with Richard. Valiantly, he hoped he could maintain his calm in Miss Elizabeth's presence. If he did not, she would know she had penetrated his barriers, and her expectations would increase. He would do nothing to encourage her affections, allowing her the dignity of decreasing her hopes on her own. It was the gentlemanly thing to do. Miss Elizabeth, is your family well? It was a poor start. Conversation in a room, like the Collins parlour, was always difficult. He rarely could follow as voices mingled and bounced off the walls. Where his cousin or Wickham were openly agreeable, he rarely felt anything other than discomfort in company. They are, Mr Darcy. Miss Elizabeth's eyes danced around the small space, looking anywhere but at him, until her next words poured from her mouth. Had you opportunity to see my sister Jane while in London, sir? I did not. He could not prevent his gulp. Along with Bingley's two sisters, Darcy personally held responsibility for encouraging Bingley to vacate Netherfield Park, leaving Miss Jane Bennet behind. Darcy's study of her countenance at Bingley's ball, held the November prior, had evidenced no true attachment on her part. When her mother, Mrs Bennet, along with Sir William Lucas, loudly exclaimed their eager anticipation of an upcoming betrothal between Miss Bennet and Charles Bingley, Darcy leapt at the chance to discourage his friend's pursuit. Miss Bennet, exhibiting no evidence of outward feeling towards Bingley, would be the sort of female easily swayed by a matchmaking parent. She would acquiesce to a marriage, no matter her pleasure or displeasure with the attachment. Obviously, they were unequal in affection. Bingley deserved only the deepest love. Until this moment, Darcy had no regrets. Had Jane Bennet been in love with Bingley? Darcy shrugged. He could not recall a time when he had misread a character. It was why he was confident Miss Elizabeth desired a connection with him. Her quick replies to his comments, her supporting his position on other occasions, indicated to him how attached she was. Mr Darcy, Colonel Fitzwilliam, my humble household is humbled by your condescension in gracing my home. Mr Collins stumbled over his humble welcome. Our home, dear, Mrs Collins interjected, to her husband's embarrassment. Yes, dearest Charlotte, this is indeed, by the magnificence of my, our esteemed patroness, our home. The parson bowed to his wife, losing his balance as he sought to present a turned leg, in what he must have heard was made popular by the dandy set. Ridiculous. Darcy's attention turned back to their guest. Miss Elizabeth, does your sister do well in London? Why on earth was he asking about Jane Bennet? He needed to speak of Wickham. Miss Elizabeth hesitated before replying, Jane enjoys the company of our aunt and uncle, as do I. I too look forward to spending time with Mr and Mrs Gardner, Mrs Collins added. They are the very best of people. Turning to her friend, she asked, Has Jane been in the company of Mr Bingley and his family during these past months? I imagine she looked forward to resuming the acquaintance. What? Why would Mrs Collins ask about Bingley? Oh, you know Darcy's friend, Colonel Fitzwilliam inquired. Bingley is a fine sort of fellow, although his eye is easily captured by a beautiful... <clears throat> Richard cleared his throat, aware he was trespassing upon information not appropriate for drawing-room conversation in mixed company. Bingley leased an estate in Hertfordshire last autumn. Darcy glared at his cousin. It was not his intention to spend the fifteen minutes appropriate for an afternoon call discussing Charles Bingley. He needed to reveal information about Wickham, but was having little success. Does the gentleman plan to return? Miss Elizabeth asked. I think not. Darcy knew Bingley had no intention to return, as long as there were objections to the lady by Darcy and his own two sisters. Despite Charles's long looks and even longer sighs, Darcy had no doubt he would be back chasing the latest pretty girl. Wait, months had passed, and Bingley had yet to show interest in resuming his social activities. Why, not even Miss Millie Stafford had tempted him. Then he should make the property available for others, as it is never good for a home to sit unoccupied for long. Miss Elizabeth's tone was sharp. Was there something wrong with the estate? 
Richard innocently inquired. Darcy wanted to shout or put his hand over his cousin's mouth. When he had the full attention of the room, he responded, No, there was nothing wrong with Netherfield Park. Then it was the neighbourhood, Richard insisted. The immediate reaction of the ladies clued Darcy that his reply needed to be well thought out. He was standing on shaky ground. Determining then and there that his cousin would pay dearly for continuing to speak of Bingley, Darcy opened his mouth to say the words he hoped would ease the uncomfortable moment. Before he could, Richard slapped his hand to his forehead. Oh, pray do not feel the need to respond, for I recall a comment from Darcy that he had to separate his friend from a skilled fortune hunter. Bingley was running for his life from a Hertfordshire lady of unequalled affections, whose mother was pushing hard for a match. I assume this is the reason he will not be returning to the estate. Pray forgive my assumptions the property was at fault. If only the ground would open up and swallow Darcy whole. Richard too. He would kill his cousin with his bare hands as soon as they left the parsonage. He could hear Miss Elizabeth's teeth grinding as she struggled to maintain her composure. Mrs Collins and her sister were faring little better. A skilled fortune hunter, Miss Elizabeth hissed, her eyes burning into his. You, you have been the means of ruining, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister. She stepped directly in front of him and poked him in the chest. No motive can excuse the unjust and ungenerous part you acted, Mr Darcy, for you have exposed one to the censure of the world for caprice and instability, the other to its derision for disappointed hopes, and involved them both in misery of the acutest kind. You, sir, are no gentleman. Oh, Lord, Richard groaned. What have I done? Cousin Elizabeth! Mr. Collins unwisely tried to intervene. You will not speak in this manner to a man closely tied to the household of de Burgh, for he will, upon the joyful event of his marriage to Miss Anne de Burgh, be the head of one of the greatest estates in England, once the two properties meld together as one. You should watch your tongue. You are to marry your cousin, Miss Elizabeth taunted. Laughing bitterly, she covered her eyes with her hands as tears poured down her cheeks. For all I have felt deep sorrow for my sister's broken heart, I confess I will feel worse for Mr. Berg. Without saying another word, she spun on her heel and left the room. Mrs. Collins and her sister soon followed. Darcy was stunned. How had things gone from terrible to worse? With nothing else left to do, he and Richard departed to the words of the parson's continuous apology for the outspokenness of his cousin's second daughter and his insistence that he would endeavour to temper her poor conduct after consulting with Lady Catherine about how best it might be done. Never had Darcy felt so low. He was overflowing with anger at himself, at Richard, and at anyone and anything else that came to his mind. As they made the short walk to Rosings, ideas of how he could correct the situation popped in and out of his brain. All seemed futile. Well, Das, the good news is the struggle as to whether or not you should ask Miss Elizabeth to marry you is over. I believe she would not have you if you offered her Pemberley on a platter. Clasping his hand to his cousin's shoulder as they strode towards their aunt's home, he added, I do apologise for sticking my big feet into your business. I thought to talk you up, to help her see what good you do in service of a friend. The need for extreme violence flowed through Darcy's veins. Utter frustration and helplessness battled inside him for dominance. The conversation had been like a snowball rolling from the top of a hill. Once it started its descent, it picked up more flakes and grew as it sped faster downward. He had been unable to catch up and stop the damage as his cousin's words hurled towards their target. Rarely had he felt as powerless. As was typical when he did, Wickham was somehow involved. Nonetheless, Despite what Miss Elizabeth declared, he was a gentleman. 4. Early the next morning, Darcy impatiently walked the groves surrounding Rosings in hopes of coming upon Miss Elizabeth. His goal was fourfold. Firstly, he would beg her forgiveness – 
Secondly, he would share his intent to inform Bingley of Miss Bennet's presence in London. Then he would apologise again. Lastly, he still needed to share his history of Wickham with Miss Elizabeth and her family. How he would manage these tasks with her in high dudgeon was unknown to him. As a man of his word, he had to make the attempt. The night before had been a torment. Now that he was completely without hope of having Elizabeth Bennet as his wife, he wanted her with a passion greater than he had before. As the mantel clock chimed each hour, he thought of valid reasons for discarding his justifications he had battled with less than four and twenty hours before. He had referred to Collins as an idiot and a fool, but a careful examination that morning in the mirror proved who deserved the appellations. By the time the sun was at its zenith, he had to admit to himself that she was apparently avoiding him. Wisely so, he would avoid himself if he could. There was nothing for him to do except return to the parsonage. With the deference of Mr Collins, he could be relied upon for an audience. Miss Elizabeth's host would make sure Darcy's appeals would be met. However, Mr Collins was not at home. The surprise crossing the ladies' faces when he was shown into the room was hard to observe. They were not only shocked to have him return, they were not desirous of his company in any way, shape or form. Grateful his cousin had not accompanied him, Darcy inherently knew humbling himself was his only path. Pray, I accept my sincerest apologies for the unpleasant revelations which occurred yesterday. I am, well, because of the topic of discussion, I was unable to make my point, nor achieve my goal. He fisted his hand behind his back, afraid the ladies would see the slight tremor he felt. Looking directly at Miss Elizabeth, he held out a folded parchment he had in his other hand. Might I beg a moment of your time to read the missive I intend to send to Bingley as soon as I leave this room? Would you be so kind as to do so aloud? Before she accepted it, she looked to her hostess. When Mrs Collins nodded, then spoke to her young sister to warn her that the information contained was to stay solely with those in attendance, Miss Elizabeth accepted the paper, unfolded it, and read. 25th March, 1812, Rosings Park. Mr Charles Bingley. I will directly state my purpose, Charles. When I counselled you last November in matters of the heart, I was wrong. Not only am I ill-qualified to give advice on so delicate a subject, I had not taken the time to know the lady. My error is grievous. For the past months, Miss Jane Bennet has been staying at the home of Mr and Mrs Gardiner, her aunt and uncle, in London. During that time, she sought out your sisters at your townhouse, only to be treated disrespectfully when they waited three weeks to return the call. How do I know these sordid details? I was party to their rudeness, arrogantly assuming I acted in the service of a friend. Pray forgive my error. If you cannot, I will accept the consequences of interfering, where I had no knowledge or experience. I am, from this moment, your servant, Fitzwilliam Darcy. Carefully refolding the missive, Miss Elizabeth glanced at him. You will send this today? Her tone was guarded, as if expecting him to insist he changed his mind and would not act. I will. He looked at Mrs Collins. Do you have a man who would see this done? I do. As he dug into his pockets for his purse, Mrs Collins moved to a writing desk in the corner to light a candle by which she placed a short piece of reddish-brown wax. Within mere moments the letter was on its way. Thank you, sir. Miss Elizabeth stared at the floor to the side of where he stood. I have another reparation to make to the ladies of this household, if I might. Mrs Collins nodded. Miss Elizabeth looked up and perused the angles of his face, like she could not believe it was him making this effort. Does Meryton still host the militia? Darcy asked. By the tilt of her head, he knew his question confused her. At Bingley's ball, the last time he had been in her company, she had challenged him regarding his supposed ill-treatment of George Wickham. He was still offended that her conversation focused on his enemy when he had graced her with the privilege of a dance, something he had not offered to any other female in Hertfordshire outside of Bingley's sisters. Propriety deemed the subject of any interchange would be his. Nevertheless, she had rapidly moved from the mundane 
to charging him with egregious offences against his former roommate. They had parted with deep-seated annoyance. He would not be surprised should she answer him now with equal acrimony. Miss Elizabeth was unafraid of confrontation. "'Are you curious about a particular officer or the whole of the regiment, sir?' She was quick, but the simple truth was, despite the position he currently found himself in, he enjoyed their repartee, even discussing the whereabouts of the man who proved himself Darcy's mortal enemy. He chose his words carefully. However, before he could continue, footsteps approached the drawing-room. In walked both Richard and Mr Collins. Once the men were settled, Richard easily joined their conversation, looking between Miss Elizabeth and him. I overheard you speaking of the militia. Might I ask, Miss Elizabeth, who is the commanding officer of the regiment? I may know him. Colonel, the morning I departed Longbourn, Colonel and Mrs Forster and Mr Wickham were expected for tea. Although I was eagerly anticipating my journey to Kent, I do regret the loss of the officer's company. Wickham? Colonel Fitzwilliam jumped from his chair, agitation clearly evident in the way he grabbed at a sword he was not currently wearing. That scoundrel! You know Mr Wickham? Darcy was unsurprised at her reaction. Regardless of her irritation with him, Miss Elizabeth's curiosity was piqued. He should not have been surprised. The rascal had been her favourite. Know him? Richard almost spat out the words. I would gladly run him... He cleared his throat, pulled the bottom of his coat, and struggled to regain calm. Pardon me, Miss Elizabeth... Mr. and Mrs. Collins, and Miss Lucas. I apologise for my quickness of temper. George Wickham is the worst sort of man, one I would not trust with a daughter or a sister. Colonel Fitzwilliam! Charlotte Collins covered her mouth with her hand, while her young, impressionable sister appeared as if she would swoon. Miss Elizabeth Bennet's shoulders pressed back, and her hands flew to her hips as she glared at Richard. "'You speak freely of a man who has earned the respect of my family and friends, sir.' "'Miss Elizabeth modulated her voice to sound free of upset. "'However, the colour in her cheeks was high, and her eyes burned with fire. "'We know the offences brought upon him by none other than your cousin, Mr Darcy. "'Your claims do nothing more than reveal your character as being one and the same as his.' "'Lizzie!' Mrs Collins looked upon her guest with horror. "'Apologise now!' Yes, Cousin Elizabeth, beg these men for their forgiveness so they will not carry your offences against them to Lady Catherine. Mr Collins fretted as he twisted his hands over and over. We are as nothing to the gentleman, Cousin, you more than anyone here. Your impertinence is both out of place and unwelcome. She was quick to respond. Mr Collins, you would allow these men to vilify a good man in your presence— one who has proved to your wife and her family his value as a jovial companion. I cannot believe a man of the church has... Lizzie! The firmness of Mrs Collins' tone brooked no argument. Yes, Charlotte. Turning to her friend, she bent her head. I apologise for disturbing the peace in your home. It was not my intention. Bobbing a curtsy, she proclaimed, Perhaps it would be a good time for me to remove myself to seek the solitude and serenity of a walk through the park. When Mrs Collins nodded her approval, Darcy asked her to stay. Mr and Mrs Collins, Miss Elizabeth, Miss Lucas, pray remain while I share information you will need to protect not only yourselves, but your families as well. Mrs Collins looked to where her young, unmarried sister sat, quietly in the corner, as Miss Elizabeth's brows rose almost to her hairline. He spoke fast. My intention yesterday was, in truth, to bring the subject of Mr Wickham into the discussion, for I have recently realised my leaving his charges against me unanswered was giving the people of Meryton the wrong impression of both him and myself. He ran his hand through his hair. While I do not know the specific charges he has levied, I am familiar with his most commonly used tales. One has me denying him a living my father had gifted Wickham in his will, another has me stealing money from him outright— He has even been known to proclaim my young sister, one of the sweetest girls in all of England, as proud and haughty in an effort to gain sympathy for him having to grow up with the fiendish Darcys. Shaking his head slowly back and forth, 
he clarified. The truth is, and I have receipts which can be provided, and witnesses to the transactions who can be interviewed. He was paid a large sum of money when he chose not to accept the living at Kimpton. In addition, I have collected a pile of receipts from debts he has incurred, from Derbyshire to London, by paying all of the innocent shopkeepers who trusted in his former connection to the Darcy family. Should I choose to hand them over to the magistrate, Wickham will spend the remainder of his life in debtor's prison. Oh, my! Mrs Collins sat back in her chair. The poor businessmen in Meryton! They will never be able to keep their families fed, should the militia not honour the burdens of the officers. Do you want to hear about the women? Darcy inquired, unsurprised when both Collins and his wife declined. He was grateful. The facts were grossly immoral, highly improper to share in mixed company. In addition, he worried that in his enthusiasm to clear his name, he would inadvertently reveal Wickham's interaction with Georgiana. While he trusted Miss Elizabeth not to gossip, he had no confidence Mr Collins would not run to Lady Catherine and reveal all. Miss Elizabeth stood quietly, her eyes focused on the floor in front of him. Her fisted hand slid from her waist to rest at her side. He waited until she finally took a deep breath, closed her eyes, exhaling slowly, and relaxed her shoulders. First, her gaze went to the colonel. Then it moved to him. Mr Darcy, you have given me much to ponder. For the protection of my sisters... I ask permission to share your comments with my father. She swallowed. Would you allow me to write the details of my history with Wickham? He offered. You could add a note before I send it via express to Longbourn. Would tomorrow morning be too soon to ready your missive? It would not. Nervous energy overtook her. Darcy understood the feeling. When he had an important task, his inclination was to see to it right away. He champed at the bit if someone attempted to divert him or slow him from undertaking the assignment. Thank you, sir. I will see to it right away. Miss Elizabeth left the room. His cousin slapped him on the shoulder. Well done, Darce. Mrs Collins extended her appreciation before steering her sister from the parlour. Once gone, only the three men remained. Mr Collins cleared his throat. Fine, sirs. I will now admit my suspicions of the man in question while I was in Hertfordshire. There was something lacking. I have no doubt had Lady Catherine been in the Shire, she would have seen through him immediately and determined the best justice to meet out. Colonel Fitzwilliam snorted as he looked down from his superior height to the clergyman. You continue to think that, Mr Collins. Slapping Darcy on the shoulder, his cousin moved to follow the ladies out of the room. Darcy had no other choice but to do the same. As they walked back to their aunt's home, Richard's growl rang through the trees lining the roadway from the parsonage to Rosings Park. Miss Elizabeth is far sharper than her dull cousin. What a ridiculous man. Darcy could not help but agree. Information is a powerful tool in the hands of the right person, Darcy. I feel your Miss Elizabeth will be grateful you shared your knowledge with her and her friend. The colonel walked briskly. Perhaps her opinion of you might soften in time. Darcy was incredulous. You honestly think there is hope? Putting his thumb and forefinger together so they barely touched, Richard speculated. Mm, about this much. But it is more than you had when you first went to the parsonage, I say. Darcy could only admit to himself he was afraid to hope. As far as he could see, Miss Elizabeth Bennet was lost to him. Was it a bad thing, or should he be relieved? His chest hurt. Never having been in this position before, he determined he would not give up. Yet, he was a Darcy. He could not quit. Her appeal was growing with each new interaction. She was without peer. Could he see her as mistress of Pemberley? beyond a doubt. Was he willing to rid himself of the constraints of family expectations to marry her? He did not know. One thing he did know for a certainty, Mr Collins was not the only fool in Kent. 5. Hours later, the party from the parsonage arrived to Rosings after a hurried invitation from his aunt. 
Smugly, Mr. Collins inserted himself next to Darcy, as if their exchange that morning made them closest of friends. The ladies, cautiously but politely, greeted Lady Catherine, Anne and her companion, Mrs. Jenkinson, before giving the men a nod. Darcy, come sit by Anne, Lady Catherine directed, leaving no room for dissent. Anne did not deign to look at him when he approached. It would be of no benefit to choose to fight this particular battle with guests in the room. No matter how hard his aunt tried to push him and his cousin together, he would stand firm. Anne de Berg would not become Mrs. Darcy. "'Would you not rather enjoy the company of the ladies?' he whispered to his cousin. The only hint she gave that she heard him was a slight lift of her shoulders. "'Is there any whose company you enjoy?' he had to ask. Hers was a lonely life. Rarely did Anne leave the confines of the house or the association of her mother. Thus her complexion was pale, and her eyes had no sparkle. "'Do you truly care?' Anne's voice was raspy, undoubtedly from disuse. Her question stunned him. Did he care? I do. Your happiness is as important to me as your mother's. You are my own mother's namesake, Anne. He struggled for words. I worry about your health. I worry you are being isolated. I worry you are being made to set aside your own desires for the preferences of Aunt Catherine. I worry you are not happy. Yet you do nothing about any of your concerns, Anne hissed. What would you have me do? Darcy was perplexed. Generally their conversations consisted solely of greetings and salutations. To his recollection, Anne had never requested anything from him, despite him attending her and her mother each year at Easter since his father's death. Five years with no hint she had expectations. Until this moment, He had thought her without an opinion of her own. How little he knew about people. His confidence in his ability to sketch a character was disintegrating by the minute. You could start by doing your duty by me, Darcy. I am soon to be your age with no prospects. Mother has kept me from the grasping hands of other gentlemen because I was formed for you. We should wed soon. I am not getting younger. I prefer to have my first child before I reach thirty. Wed? Child? He could barely keep from shuddering. Anne expected him to marry her. Why have you not spoken before now, cousin? He had certainly read her poorly. If asked, he would have had no qualms about stating her revulsion at being the mistress of Pemberley and the wife of Fitzwilliam Darcy. Apparently he would have been wrong. Why should I have to speak on this subject at all? As the gentleman, you bear the task of making the offer, not me. In truth, I am highly disappointed in you for not doing your duty already. You, too, are not getting any younger. Aunt Catherine loudly demanded her share of the conversation. Of what are you speaking, Darcy? Anne replied before he could open his mouth. Mother, do not be concerned. Darcy and I are discussing our future. His aunt's face beamed with joy. If you would rush to London on the morrow, nephew, you could return with a special licence within a week. You would miss Mr. Collins' Easter sermon, but I cannot see how it can be helped. Appalled at his aunt's attempt to force him to act according to her wishes by making them public, he stood and stepped away from Anne. I will not. Glancing at Miss Elizabeth, he could see her discomfort. Was it with the lack of decorum of his de Burgh relatives? Or might it be because he might be lost to her forever, should he accede to his aunt's demands? Sincerely, he doubted it was the latter. She had made her feelings known to him very clearly at the parsonage. Walking to where Richard silently stood by the fireplace, Darcy directly faced both his aunt and Anne. Since you have made our family business known, I will not hesitate to remind you that there has been no offer of marriage made by me, nor will there ever be an attachment between Anne and myself. Aunt Catherine stood from her throne, the stamping of her cane muted on the carpeted floor. How dare you deny your duty! Your mother, my own dearest sister, 
from the time you were in the cradle, desired nothing more than for our houses to be joined by your marriage. Her heart would break to see you stand against me, your closest living relative. You should be ashamed, Darcy. Seeing the looks of embarrassment on the faces of the female guests, Mr. Collins appeared confused. Darcy decided to put an end to the topic. I will not be moved, aunt. Neither father nor mother spoke of an arrangement made between you and them, so I have no moral obligation to marry Anne, nor would I believe a lady would desire a connection based upon demand. He forced his fists to relax. I will not wed without deep affection and respect for my intended. I have only familial feelings towards Anne, nothing more. He scanned the faces of each individual in the room, before making his final proclamation. I am finished with this subject. We shall speak upon this no more. Bowing to no one in particular, he walked from the room. The evening sky broadcast subtle hues of pink and orange as dusk was setting in, casting the grounds of the park into colourful shadows. Darcy's troubles, while weighty, did not detract from his notice of the beauty surrounding him. When he ultimately stepped through the trees into his favourite glen, a rose, yellow and peach rainbow reflected across the pond, shimmering as a fish came to the surface looking for a snack. Like a starving man required food, he desperately needed serenity. Sitting on a fallen log next to the shoreline, he pondered all that had gone terribly wrong since arriving in Kent. Miss Elizabeth, instead of holding him in affection, appeared to hate him. Anne, who he had assumed wanted nothing to do with him, wanted to be tied to him for their lifetime. His error in forcing a separation between Bingley and Miss Bennet was lamentable, and its disregarding his responsibility to the people affected by Wickham was heinous. Rolling his shoulders, he hoped to shift the heavy weight of his sins from his back to the ground. Never had it worked before, and it did not now. Part of the burden of being a large landowner with a bevy of servants and tenants under his care was the accountability he had to his family name to succeed. However, it was his own desire to be a good steward, to better the lives of those around him, that drove his decisions. He had failed spectacularly. Reaching down, he selected a small pebble and tossed it into the water, watching the ribbons of colour dance. Within moments, the water settled into its natural calm. Life was the same. Disturbances rarely lasted long before they either went away or were replaced by another tragedy. It had been the same in his father's time and would be the same for his children, he had no doubt. Children. Yes, he hoped for many children to fill his home. But who would be the mother of his progeny? Darcy scoffed. It appeared the woman he wanted did not want him at all. Women he did not want hunted him like a pack of hounds with a weary fox. Enough, he spoke into the silence, disturbing birds starting to nest for the night. Sir? He spun at her sweet voice, embarrassed to have been caught with less than his normal composure. Miss Elizabeth, I beg your pardon for startling you. I was not aware you had entered the glen. Nor was I aware you were seated here. She indicated the log. I shall depart and leave you to your... troubles. Lifting his hands, his palms to the heavens, he suddenly dropped them to his sides. You can no longer think I am enjoying this peaceful verdure with my outburst. I apologise, miss, for ruining your enjoyment as well. She hesitated, like a fawn would do at a hint of disturbance. Her inner struggle was as obvious to him as if she were verbalising her thoughts. Finally, Kindness must have won the battle with her desire to flee. Might I be of some assistance, sir? If only you could. He spoke softly to himself, uncaring if she heard. Addressing her directly, he inquired, I must ask, Miss Elizabeth, if you have ever wanted something so badly you almost ached for the yearning. In your mind you have calculated the cost against the expected blessings— You have no doubt of the practical value of the item, as you realise how many ways you would benefit with the possession. Yet no matter how hard you work to achieve your goal, it remains frustratingly out of reach. I have. He desperately wanted her to share 
and was grateful when she continued. My greatest longing is for the happiness of my sisters, all of them. She bit her lip, and he suspected she was considering how open she should be with him. Am I willing to sacrifice my preferences for them to have the result for which they ache? I would. With that said, Mr. Darcy, would I be willing to marry a man I did not love, merely to increase my family's status and finances? Never. But I would work my fingers to the bone if I thought it would add to their portions, so they could attract the quality of men who would value them for their good qualities. Then you see my dilemma. He wondered how she would respond if she knew it was his yearning for her that tormented his soul. Realistically, he would never know. Is what you want so unattainable? Is the cost too dear? Or is it something rare and precious that belongs to another? She shrugged her slim shoulders. Would it be any of these circumstances? I could see how it would taunt you. How much should he admit? The unexpected interchange had his internal hope quotient flowing rapidly from his toes to his nose, pooling around his rapidly beating heart. Might I ask your female opinion of my male expectations? He queried. I cannot begin to imagine what you are about, sir. Nonetheless, I will admit you have piqued my interest. Please proceed. She accepted his challenge. Taking one step closer, he set aside his typical reticence and asked, Am I asking too much to want to marry a woman who I am confident will make me happy? Not at all was her immediate answer. Tell me about this woman. She would be kind to others, including those beneath her sphere. I have almost two hundred servants and tenants at Pemberley alone who rely on the care I give to my household. The woman I marry should want them to be well cared for. She would easily see humour in situations where I am blind. She would bring laughter and joy to a quiet, lonely man. She would want children and would expect her husband to be equally devoted to their daily lives, as well as assuring they had a good future. She would... He swallowed. She would want to spend as much time with me as I would desire to be in her company. She would allow me to tend her if she was ill. She would accept my flaws as I would overlook hers. She would... He could say no more. Everything he felt about the young woman in front of him had been aired. He could only wait for her to reply to see if she understood his meaning. His shoulders drooped under the weight of expectation. You do not expect too much at all. She would not look at him. Her eyes appeared to study each blade of grass at her feet. Do you think I could find such a woman? He boldly asked, feeling he had nothing to lose. My hope, my dream, is there is someone of that description for each of my sisters... She shook her head. Will I find such a man before I am considered on the shelf? I do not know. Will I find him before Kitty or Lydia are distracted by a handsome face in an officer's uniform? I desperately hope I do. Would you recognise him if he stood directly in front of you? His thoughts flowed from his mouth before he could stop them. I do not know. At that, she looked into his eyes, then bid him adieu. The evening sky was darkening. She would be required at the parsonage. As he watched her walk away, he could only wonder if his mind had finally caught up with his heart. Was he ready to offer for her hand? Simply put, he did not yet know. 6. The following morning, Darcy again approached the parsonage. In his hand this time was a letter outlining enough information for a wise man like Mr. Bennet to comprehend the danger of allowing Wickham to continue freely moving in Meryton's society. With each scratching of the quill, Darcy had thought of the principle of consequences. The conclusions were shocking. Before he could consider the subject further, he rounded the hedge to approach the parsonage gate. He was pleasantly surprised when Miss Elizabeth emerged through the open door of the house, her hands busily tying the blue ribbons of her bonnet loosely under her chin. Darcy interrupted her actions. Your ribbons, they are uncomfortable. Since when had he started to speak what he was thinking? He would have to watch himself around her, for his thoughts often strayed to the impossible, 
what his life would be should she become his bride. My ribbons. Puzzled, she picked up the ends and held them up for his view. I suppose I've never liked them tied tightly, which has disturbed my mother since my youth. She elevated the pitch of her voice until it matched Mrs. Bennet's shriek. Lizzie Bennet, no man will ever look your way with your sloppy bows, loose curls and dusty hem. Shame upon you and all of us for ruining our family's reputation. Having you for a daughter will be the death of me. As Miss Elizabeth spoke, she dramatically placed the back of her hand against her brow, lowering her eyelids and tipping her head back slightly. A chuckle burst from him as he shook his head. She was a wonder. Between my bonnets and the condition of my hems when I return from a stroll, I'm truly unsurprised by Mamma's reaction. She is a mother consumed by the futures of all five of us. As she should be. His bow was formal. I apologise, Miss Elizabeth. I have not yet wished you a good day. She curtsied. Good day to you, sir. You are well? I am. She looked at him, confused. Why would I not be? The conversation yesterday. He had no clue how to continue. Mr. Darcy, my character does not allow me to dwell upon unpleasantness. I choose to remember the past as it gives me pleasure, and that includes yesterday's interchange. However, know this, sir. This does not mean I did not listen carefully to what was said, for I heard each word. My head is brimming with unanswered questions, and my heart nags me with the embarrassment of knowing I sketched Mr. Wickham's character inaccurately. My next thought was whether or not I had done the same to others. It was a humbling way to spend the dark hours. Do not in any way blame yourself. I alone bear responsibility. Sir, I will remind you that everyone starts each day anew. What I learn from you will stick with me, as I use the information to adjust my viewpoint and actions. I'm not one to hold on to a grudge, especially when an apology was offered, which it was. She scoffed. Well, that was untrue. I am very likely to hold on to resentment, despite a good apology, if the truth is known. I'm a horrid person, sir. Not at all. It was then he saw her smile. His relief was immediate. Hesitating, his nerves struggling to get the best of him, he cleared his throat, something he had been doing frequently of late. Might you desire company for your stroll? When he noted how her smile deepened, heat started rising from his chest to his neck, to his cheeks. He was blushing. Oh, good heavens. At almost eight and twenty years, he had long passed adolescence, where his voice cracked as he spoke. Females both drew his attention and, horrifyingly, increased his awkwardness. The gleam in her eyes danced as she grinned at him, an action he perceived had been rare, at least towards him, indeed. Mr. Darcy, are you wanting to walk with me, or did you have someone else in mind? Perhaps the Colonel, or your betrothed? My betrothed? Oh, yes, well, about that, Miss Elizabeth, your... your cousin spoke out of turn as I have never offered my hand to any woman. He stopped himself. No, like you, I prevaricated. Unfastening the gate so she could walk through, he stepped to her side as she moved forward, her eyes directly upon him, her head tipped in a delightful fashion as she curiously waited for him to continue. When I was quite young, Cook introduced our household to the most delightful cinnamon buns for breaking our fast on Saturday mornings. They were served warm with cold milk. I found them to be the perfect mixture of sugar and spice. He smiled at the memory. As a growing boy, I was in a constant state of hunger. I was also blessed, or rather cursed, with a penchant for dessert. Offering his arm to her, he wondered if she would accept. After hesitating, she placed her hand at the bend of his elbow. He was quite pleased. Determined to keep the conversation light, he continued... One midweek morning I boldly strutted downstairs to the kitchen and demanded Cook serve the rolls. At that time she had been at Pemberley for almost thirty years. She had no doubt who the master was, and it was not me. Once refused, I crept back upstairs, humiliated at being set down by a servant, and disappointed I was not getting the rolls. Whatever did you do? Her voice was as light and pleasing as her figure. 
I decided, as only a young boy would do, to ask Cook to marry me. If she would not accept my authority as heir to the estate, perhaps she would do so as my wife. Delighted laughter floated on the gentle morning breeze. Goodness, Mr. Darcy, it was a bold move, even for a little boy. Cook grabbed me by the ear and marched me to my father's study, where she asked the true master whether he would approve of her becoming his daughter. I cannot imagine. What did your father say? Clasping her free hand over her other, she tugged his elbow to hurry him along. Warmth, of a different sort, poured into his chest, increasing the rapidity of Darcy's heartbeat. Breathe in, breathe out. He asked if Cook was the woman of my dreams. Breaking eye contact, Darcy studied the small gravel under their feet. I assured him that so long as she baked me cinnamon buns each morning, I would be happily wed. He huffed. Cook still had a tight grasp of my ear. She pinched it harder at my comment. I quickly amended my petition to having the sweet pastry served every other day, not wanting to put the woman out overly much. How considerate you were, sir, Miss Elizabeth snickered. I thought so, he easily agreed. Then my father asked how I intended to support my new wife. I was confused. Support? I was only five years of age. My small bank in the nursery had a few coins within, but certainly not enough for Cook. She was quite round, and with the bluntness of youth, which she could clearly hear, I told my father so. Oh, no! Oh, yes. She twisted my ear so hard I thought it would stay bent my whole life. From the corner of his eye, he saw her head move and knew exactly where she looked. His ear. The damage was not permanent? It was not. He mourned when her free hand dropped back to her side. He had enjoyed her tight clasp of his arm far too much. Clearing his throat again. Good grief, she will think he has a throat condition. He added as they turned off the main road to a path through the trees... Cook reminded me she already possessed a worthless husband, and she certainly did not need a little boy to tell her what to do. I was banished from the kitchen, and had to wait a full two and a half weeks until my favourite buns were served. It was a lesson well learned. I stayed out of the kitchen, and never again asked a lady for her hand in marriage, including my cousin Anne. What a wonderful tale, Mr Darcy. The perfect way to start the day. I am glad you enjoyed my suffering, Miss Elizabeth. Boldly, he placed his hand over her lace-clad fingers. The need to remove their gloves and entwine his fingers with her delicate ones rose inside him to such a degree that he almost acted upon his desires. It would not do. Breathing deeply, he calmed himself. He had placed the letter for Mr. Bennet in his coat pocket before opening the parsonage gate. They still had serious business to discuss. While he felt no qualms about sharing his tale... It merely postponed the inevitable. Miss Elizabeth, I spent the whole of the night thinking about how far-reaching George Wickham's actions have travelled, and I am heartily ashamed I have not acted previously to stop him. Their steps slowed, until she stopped completely, her hand regretfully dropping from his elbow. Pray explain yourself. Her gaze was focused on some distant point. What I did not tell you yesterday as it would ruin the reputation of a wonderful young lady should it become known, was that Wickham imposed himself upon my own sister last July. Mr. Tarsi, no! Her hands covered her mouth as horror filled her eyes. Yes, I am sorry to say it is the truth. In as few words as possible, he explained how Wickham had turned his charm upon Darcy's fifteen-year-old sister, taking advantage of her innocence and loneliness to encourage her towards his goal. Is she well? Miss Elizabeth kindly inquired. Shaking his head, now it was he who studied the ground. I hardly know how to answer. What little confidence she had has vanished, and I fear her trust in men is non-existent. Georgiana has been a quiet child all her life when in company. When we were alone, she would easily share her joy. The death of our father five years ago was a blow which robbed her of that joy. At first, she would cling to me, and I was grateful I could provide comfort. As time passed, she seemed to regain her footing. 
When she suggested a summer at the sea with her new companion, I was pleased. Her companion? Did she not contact you when Mr. Wickham began paying particular attention to your sister? How could she not? Mrs. Young was in an improper relationship with Wickham, Miss Elizabeth. She welcomed his presence. The two of them sought to use my sister and her dowry of thirty thousand to set up an establishment for themselves after ruining Georgiana. They would have sent her back to Pemberley, a broken woman. Shame on them! Miss Elizabeth stomped her foot. Cannot anything be done? They need to be stopped. Mr. Darcy, while I understand your need for secrecy with Miss Darcy, how could you wait this long before taking Mr. Wickham to task? If he has, as you said, done this to other females, imagine the damage to their feelings as well as their reputations. Should they have other sisters as I have, the whole of them would be unable to marry, creating a tremendous burden upon the parents. He comprehended her anger and disappointment in him. He felt the same. This is what I considered during the night, and what led me to ask your father to make Wickham's crimes known to the businesses in Meryton. I have also offered, as I have done in the past, to cover his debts. And this is why you spoke to me of your sister? Yes, I have no doubt that in time you would have wisely identified flaws in Wickham's character. Whether or not your younger sisters would have done so was a risk I could not take. With Mr. Bennet's guidance, they can avoid entangling themselves with the rake. He felt her eyes upon him. Looking up, he was stunned to see a softness radiating from them. The skin around them relaxed. They were more beautiful than diamonds, reflecting her inner emotions as clearly as if he was reading them in a book. I thank you, sir. Softly she spoke. Your kindness in sharing your tales is exemplary. I will return to the parsonage to complete my note to Papa so the express can be sent. I thank you as well for explaining to Mr Bingley the incorrectness of your point of view of my sister Jane. While I am confident her attachment to him has not waned, I do not know how the months have treated him. Should a match be made, it will now be up to them, will it not? Yes, it will, he nodded. He could not look away from her. A few light brown freckles dotted her nose. Her cheeks were the shade of a lovely pink rose. Her mouth? Her lips were a rich red where she was biting the bottom corner with her straight upper teeth. They looked like pearls. But it was her eyes, her glorious orbs, that captured and held his attention. The blue of the sky was reflected in their depths. Darcy knew without a doubt, at that moment in time, he could look in them forever. They would be the first thing he would see each morning, and the last thing before he closed his own eyes at night. He wanted to marry her. He wanted her for his wife, forevermore. He was as deep as a man could get in love with Miss Elizabeth Bennet. 7. You have a bounce to your step and a smile on your face, Darcy. I suggest you get rid of both before Aunt Catherine sees you. Richard met him at his approach to Rosings Park. She's been in a rage all morning, demanding to know the reason for your absence from her table, and fretting for whatever reason an unreasonable female would fret. There was no need for the colonel to explain his final comment. Lady Catherine de Bourgh had one modus operandi. What she opined was always correct, and her concerns were the only ones that mattered to her. Thus, in her self-exaltation, her opinions were the only ones of import to anyone else as well. Using his shoulder to bump into Darcy's, Richard asked, So, where were you anyway? I have no doubt you left Rosings with a frown, yet you return with a happy countenance. Who are you and what have you done with my perpetually grumpy younger cousin? Silence was always the best response. Richard had never been able to let it go. He was like a dog chasing its tail when his curiosity was unsatisfied. Darcy enjoyed having the advantage. He was happy. Had he known the satisfaction he would feel from completing the onerous task of bringing Wickham's sins to light and trying to repair the damage he had done Bingley, he would have acted long ago. Richard, I have started down the path of justice against my nemesis. And I am grateful for your efforts. But you are aware that letting Hertfordshire know about Wickham is only the beginning— he will likely be run off and discharged from the militia, which means he will look somewhere else to feed his insatiable appetite for easy monies and ladies.'
Yes, this was exactly my thought. Darcy smirked, pleased he would be able to place his cousin in a difficult situation, since Richard had done the same to him with his confession about Bingley. Therefore I need the assistance only you can provide. Richard stood taller. I am at your service. By then, they were climbing the steps to the front entrance of their aunt's house. Before entering, Darcy continued, delighted the colonel had easily jumped into his trap. I am unsurprised at your willingness, cousin. You are, despite what I have claimed for decades, a good man. Rubbing his hands together, Richard practically danced on the spot. What good can I do you? Sharpen my sword to lop off George's head? Clean my pistol so my shot goes deep into his heart? Run him over with your carriage? Darcy wanted to grin. Oh, but this felt good. Not at all, although each idea is worth serious consideration. As the front door was open for the two men, he delivered the coup de grace. What I need from you... He paused to enjoy the moment. Yes? Is to distract Aunt Catherine until I can ride to London to gather the receipts of payments I have already made on Wickham's debts, travel on to Meryton, deliver proof of Wickham's perfidy to Mr. Bennet and Colonel Forster, pay what he owes to the merchants of the village, find the rake and tell him I am finished cleaning up the messes he leaves behind and offer him one-way transport out of England. Should he unwisely choose not to accept my sterling kindness, I will turn notice of the fortune he owes me over to the magistrate for immediate collection. I will not hesitate to see him in Marshalsea. Speaking of the man he grew up with, coming to his ruin, diminished his joy. Darcy would forever bear the burden of knowing his course would have disappointed his father. I will see to the horses. Richard completely ignored his assigned task. Aunt Catherine will not suffer for not having us to torment with her demands for a day or two. In fact, it will give her opportunity to expand her imagination, as she takes minute estate matters and blows them into world-changing necessities that only you, my capable cousin, can set to right. Before Darcy could stop him, the colonel hurried to the stables. With his military experience, Darcy knew little time would be needed for his cousin to be ready to depart. Rushing into the house to gather the necessary items from his valet, he stopped to warn his aunt of their immediate departure. The brief conversation did not go well. However, it could not be helped. By the time he was ready, Richard stood with both horses, his saddlebags already packed. Without a word, they mounted and headed west. Darcy was exhausted. What should have taken approximately four and twenty hours took three days, three whole frustrating days, before he and Richard rode their weary horses back to Rosings stables. During the long ride to Meryton, the two men discussed ad nauseum the best means of catching Wickham unaware. They would have met with success had Miss Lydia Bennet not spied them entering the camp outside of the village. What she was doing there, unchaperoned at barely sixteen, Darcy had to wonder. When he later apprised her father of Miss Lydia's actions, Mr. Bennet minimised the impact and justified it as being the accomplishments of a silly girl. Both Darcy and his cousin were flummoxed. How a father could leave a child unprotected amidst ravenous wolves was unpardonable. Elizabeth, as he now thought of her far less formally, would immediately have comprehended the danger. Darcy had no doubt she would step in to direct the youngest Bennet to a more proper course. On alert, Wickham had taken one look at Richard and run. Instead of giving chase, the cousins appealed to Colonel Forster to take control of his errant lieutenant. By the time his officers had captured Wickham, his crimes had been laid out in front of his commanding officer, until Colonel Forster realised there was no choice but to lock him up. During the time the cousins settled accounts with the merchants, they discovered that whispers of improper conduct on the part of both Miss Kitty Bennet and her sister Lydia were widespread. Elizabeth would be mortified. It was a weary man who approached the parsonage. Richard had ridden on to Rosings Park, so Darcy was facing her alone. For that, he was appreciative. Mrs Collins remained in the parlour while he and Elizabeth spoke. Darcy was glad her husband had already made his daily sojourn to Lady Catherine. He trusted the parson's wife with a sensitive subject. He did not trust her husband at all. The look of fear on Elizabeth's beautiful face 
ripped his heart out, for he had no power in this situation. Certainly, he had removed Wickham from the populace of the Meryton neighbourhood, but the damage to the reputations of her youngest sisters was done. However, it was the response of Mrs Collins which added to the distress. Fortunately, he was not the only one who noticed. Elizabeth clasped the hands of her friend. Charlotte, what has happened? Oh, dear! Mrs Collins' face had lost all colour. An express rider came not thirty minutes ago. My husband, as is his usual wont, did not open the letter, as he knows Lady Catherine appreciates being the first to learn our news. Darcy knew her claim of his aunt to be true. I have learned to be patient. When he returns from Rosings Park, he will share not only the contents of the message, but will add our patroness's observations and opinions as he reads. The express came from Meryton. From my mother. The pallor of Elizabeth's cheeks now matched her former neighbours. She looked to Darcy and clarified. Lady Lucas and my mother compete for their share of the latest gossip. Neither woman intends harm, yet in their rush to tell a story, small details are embellished until they bear little resemblance to known facts. Often the point of the tale is lost in the telling. She stood and paced the small room. This is everything dreadful. His inclination was to go to her and wrap her in his arms, letting her know he would make this right. Not only would his efforts to bring her comfort break every rule of propriety known to mankind, her heart would most likely not be receptive to his desires. In her fury at the circumstances, she would slap him soundly. Lizzie, we cannot worry over Lady Catherine's reactions, as she is wholly unrelated to you, Mrs Collins offered. Surprised, Elizabeth stopped in front of her friend. Lady Catherine, why would I be concerned with her opinion? She is nothing to me. Intellectually, he knew her comment to be true. Nevertheless, when a man had rank and position seared into his brain since his birth, her disregard of his aunt's societal importance set him back to where he was before he justified Elizabeth's importance to him. Had he learned nothing? Was that not one of the things he loved most about her? Yes, it was. In the moment of silence, his mind spun as name after name of peers of the realm, whom he avoided like the plague, because of their inappropriate habits, jolted him to the realisation that he, too, felt the same as Elizabeth. Obviously, these ladies and gentlemen, despite being born into the most prominent families in the kingdom, benefited greatly because of their parentage. But did it inherently mean they were valuable additions to society? Not at all. His Aunt Catherine, the daughter of an earl and widow of a baron, felt entitled to adoration and respect, though whether she was deserving of such was a constant source of frustration to him. Darcy's father was a landed gentleman, who until his death had no desire for a title. In Darcy's recollection, his mother, the daughter of the same earl, was the individual in the marriage who gave importance to position. It was a point of contention he easily recalled. The stress of her demands and disappointment at her husband's lack of ambition frustrated her. Gerald Darcy could have purchased rank. He had the funds. Despite his ability, he chose not to become what he was not born to be. Running his hands over his face, Darcy felt the dust from the road. He was like his father, a man of the earth, with his feet solidly upon the ground. He was contented being a gentleman farmer, for that was what he was, albeit a very wealthy gentleman farmer. He needed no title to know his self-worth. I must return to Longbourn at once. Elizabeth hugged her friend. Your hospitality has been exemplary, and I have enjoyed my time here immensely. Stepping back, she took Mrs Collins' hands in her own. Your husband will want me gone, for the news will bring Lady Catherine's displeasure and disapprobation. Would you spare a maid to help me pack while I walk to Huntsford to see about transport? Ah, he finally had something he could do to assist her. Pray do not be concerned about travel, Miss Elizabeth. My coach and driver can be ready within the hour. We can be in London before evening sets and arrive in Meryton as early in the morning as you choose to be ready. Would you think Miss Bennet would also desire to return to Longbourn? There is room enough in my carriage for all of us. You would do this for us, 
Her hand had gone to her chest as she looked at him quizzically. I would do it for you, he stated unequivocally. He would leave her and Mrs. Collins with no question of his affection. He spied the barest hint of a smile before Elizabeth excused herself from the room. Before she could leave, she turned back and requested writing materials from Mrs. Collins. She would write a note to her aunt and uncle, informing them of her impending arrival, so her sister would be ready to leave in the morning. Darcy waited until she finished, before gathering her letter to add to the one he felt was now necessary to pen. Bingley needed to know the situation. Darcy could not imagine his young friend being turned away from Miss Bennet because of the tattling of two nosy women, but he needed to make his own choice. Also, Darcy hoped Bingley would be willing to open Netherfield Park. The inn in Meryton had little to recommend it to travellers. Darcy had no hope of being invited to stay at Longbourn. He and Mr. Bennet had not parted on the best of terms. Lady Catherine had been livid when Darcy announced he and Richard would be departing immediately. When she assumed they were rushing to London to order a special wedding licence, her initial response was joy. At his denial, her temper flared. Her outbursts were, surprisingly, matched by her daughter. "'You are abandoning me again. You are a brute, Fitzwilliam Darcy,' Anne whined. "'I cannot think I will wait for you any longer, cousin. You will be sorry when I marry the next man who offers. You will regret it your whole life if you do not make me your wife.' He was stunned. From the look on his face, the colonel was also. Darcy had no clue she would continue to insist on marriage. Her whisper for his ears only of, "'I despise you, Darcy. I always have,' released him from any obligation, had he felt any. "'Let me be perfectly clear, Anne. I have not offered for you, nor will I do so now or later. I wish you happy in your marriage to the next man who offers for you.' His bow was stately, and it was final. His mind was already on the multitude of tasks needed to be completed so he could gather Elizabeth and be on the road to London. "'You have not heard the end of this, Fitzwilliam Darcy!' Aunt Catherine had to have the last word. "'I imagine not. Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam may have made the statement aloud, but Darcy could not help but agree. 8. Both Darcy and Richard were pleased when Elizabeth welcomed them into the carriage. Not only were they sore from their hours in the saddle, a light spring rain had started to fall. Elizabeth first saw to the comfort of the accompanying maid before settling in with the book. Across from her sat an amused Colonel Fitzwilliam and a puzzled Darcy. She would rather pass the long hours to London with a book under her nose. Am I not a good enough conversationalist? Oh, never mind. The answer to that question was plain enough, with his struggles to make himself clearly understood by her. With no one else of his acquaintance did he have to make the effort. Being in close proximity discomposed him to a degree previously unknown to him. "'I am pleased to see you enjoy reading, Miss Elizabeth. The Pemberley Library is second to none,' Richard offered. "'The next time you travel to Derbyshire, if I were you, "'I would plan to spend equal amounts of time roaming Pemberley's grounds "'and perusing the shelves. They both have much to offer. "'You will never want to leave.' "'Richard!' Darcy was horrified. "'When his cousin turned to him and winked, "'Darcy knew the first leg of the trip would be long and fraught "'with Richard's sorry attempts at matchmaking. "'Stop this now. You are embarrassing Miss Elizabeth.' Sure enough, her face flamed. However, she was undaunted. I promise you, Colonel Fitzwilliam, should my aunt and uncle decide to spend time near Mr. Darcy's estate when we travel to the Lakes and the Peak District this summer, I shall encourage them to call at Pemberley, if Mr. Darcy approves. Elizabeth was coming to Derbyshire. Darcy's breath caught. He had no need to hesitate. Pray, no, you and your family would be welcome to stay at Pemberley during your holiday. Was his voice even, or had it quivered? His heart pounded at the possibility of welcoming her into his home. Would this be the uncle in trade? He cared not. Despite summer being months away, he would start planning now. His sister was currently staying in London, 
he would bring her home. She was the best part of Darcy, his most devoted supporter. He should write his housekeeper, Mrs. Reynolds, as soon as he arrives at Darcy House, to have the guest rooms aired. Perhaps Miss Elizabeth would like the blue chambers. They had the best view of the gardens. Of course, that the blue chambers were connected to his bedchambers. He wanted to slap the ridiculousness out of himself. He still was not certain she even liked him. She would never agree to stay in... Perhaps he would not tell her there was a common sitting room shared by the master and... He forced his brain to consider something else. He could not look at her. The familiar landscape out the window closest to him captured his full attention. At least he hoped it looked to the others like it had. The gentle mist had faded away. Bright sunlight glistened across the moisture on the glass. The glare hurt his eyes. He had to turn back to avoid being blinded by the light. Look, the rain has stopped. Darcy nudged his cousin. We should ride. The saddles will be wet. Our horses would not appreciate bearing our weight. What? Richard's mount was battle-hardened and was used to being ridden under adverse conditions. Darcy's own mare balked at being tied behind a carriage for any length of time. Elizabeth stopped him before he could tap on the ceiling, halting the carriage. Before you go, might you share with me the conversation with my father, and I should like to know what exactly was done with Mr. Wickham and what you overheard about my sisters. I can then discern how to best help them. She glanced at the maid, whose hands were busy with needlework, but her ears were tuned towards the conversation. Might I also hear Lady Catherine's reaction to your departure? I fear the letter Mr. Collins read to her will cause no end of consternation for Charlotte. I would not have her harmed for the world. Her anxiety was Darcy's undoing. He would be going nowhere. He paused, his discomfort becoming a living, breathing monster threatening to devour him. What he had to say in response could hurt her, disappoint her, and potentially wound her. Mr. Bennet, I believe, has a desire, as do most fathers, I suspect, of wanting his youngest daughters to remain children. The growing signs of maturity can be overlooked by a man whose fondest memories are of playful interaction with those same little girls. He breathed deeply. Circumstances are much different for a male child. The father seems to push for growth as he trains and nurtures the boy into adolescence and manhood. He continued his line of reasoning. My own father acted thus with Georgiana and me. He would set me up on the saddle in front of him to ride the estate before I was out of leading strings. For Georgiana, he would not allow her close to a horse until her pleading wore him down when she was about six years old. I was sent to his tailor to dress like a gentleman before my first tutor arrived. Georgiana was kept in ruffles and pink far longer than she desired. His sister despised frills. This difference in the way my father responded to his children, I am thinking, is the same, I believe, as your own father. Rather than seeing in his two youngest the bloom of youth, his memories fog his mind until he does not see them as others do. Be that as it may, Elizabeth replied, they are out in society, and their actions will forever taint the Bennet family and any who are associated with the Bennet name. To excuse poor conduct because of emotional attachment is flawed, sir. I cannot bring myself to understand Papa's not taking action. Pray, forgive me. My concern should be brought to my father rather than laid out for public perusal. Her clasped hands pulled her gloves taut over her knuckles. Her chin quivered. He knew not whether it was anger or tears threatening. What he did know was he would do anything to comfort and reassure her. Yes, you should speak with Mr. Bennet. He nodded as he spoke. Yet because your father's cousin deigned to make your family's business known to my aunt, the consequences to you personally had you remained at Huntsford Parsonage would have been dire. My aunt would not hesitate to make you feel her wrath and judgmental proclamations against every member of your family. He added, During the past few days... You and I have spent time in conversation where my own failings have been brought into the open. As you chose not to condemn me to my face, I would offer you the same consideration.'
In this instance, the floor is not your own. Had I not overlooked the sufferings and damage left behind each time Wickham moved in and out of a new location, had he not coerced Miss Kitty and Miss Lydia into conduct unbecoming a lady, this topic would be moot. You are taking far too much upon yourself, sir, Elizabeth proclaimed. In doing so, you steal the accountability of being a good parent right out from underneath my father. Should Wickham never have arrived in Hertfordshire, I strongly suspect my sisters would have managed to bring reproach on their own. My papa, whom I love above all men, is not without imperfections. His propensity to find merriment in the foibles of others has been a pattern I, to my shame, have imitated. No longer. I clearly see the error of laughing at, rather than reaching out to a just poor conduct. I hope to not be the same Elizabeth Bennet when I return to Longbourn as when I left. Her chin lifted as her eyes pierced his own. He loved her determination and had no question in her ability to stand firm. He, too, had seen the need to make many changes the past few days in Kent. At her chuckle, he wondered at her. Lifting a brow, as she had often done, he questioned her without words. "'My good sirs, can you imagine how disappointed your aunt would be by my not quailing under her sternly administered discipline should I have stayed with Charlotte? I had not learned the value of refraining from laughter at the absurd. My offences against her would be great indeed.' Elizabeth's laughter floated like a sweet melody inside the coach. She would demand I leave as my impertinence would be a horrid example for Mr. Berg. Richard, who was grinning at her comment, said, Do not worry about Anne. Before I left, I confirmed Darcy had no interest in pursuing her for a bride, as his attentions were elsewhere. You said what? Darcy could not believe his cousin had done something so foolish. What have you done, Richard? I was endeavouring to help you out of a sticky situation, Darcy. Confusion blanketed his cousin's face. Anne was still speaking of her attachment to you, and Aunt Catherine was sputtering about teaching you a lesson in humility before she would welcome you as a husband to her daughter when I returned downstairs from readying to take my leave. My efforts were to dissuade them from acting unwisely, which would make them look bad in the eyes of the ton, and would irritate you, making you a terrible travelling companion. You see... I acted in the service of a friend and favourite family member. Dropping his head back to rest on the padded wall of the carriage, Darcy closed his eyes as he heard Elizabeth groan aloud. She will conclude your interest is in me, Mr Darcy, Elizabeth muttered softly. Of that I have no doubt. Darcy kept his eyes closed. His mind spun with the repercussions of what his cousin had done. I also do not doubt she is readying her coach as we speak, preparing to invade first Darcy House and then Longbourn until she has her say and attempts to gain her way. He opened his eyes and glanced at his cousin. Thank you, Richard. Your well-meaning help will draw the dragon from her lair to swoop down with her sword drawn and fire and smoke coming from her nostrils. The image captured in my mind will stay with me for the rest of my lifetime, Darcy. Richard guffawed. Perhaps it is time you used your greatest weapon against her to tame the beast. Darcy shook his head. Intense anger at the situation, not so much at the man, fueled his speech. Of what are you referring, Richard Fitzwilliam? Are you so lost to reality that we should leave you at Bedlam when we travel by? What weapon? What beast? Aunt Catherine or Anne? His cousin shrugged his shoulders. In actuality, I would say both of them qualify for the appellation. When the colonel's eyes darted back and forth between him and Elizabeth, Darcy worried at what else would come from Richard's mouth. When the colonel smiled, Darcy knew he was up to mischief. Clamping his hand down hard on Richard's elbow, he squeezed with all his might. Silence, Darcy demanded. Why had he assumed Richard would obey? He never had in the past. His cousin settled into the seat, making himself comfortable before opening his mouth. I recall the story of St. George and the Dragon, 
He used the sign of the cross and a large sword to rid the village of the beast. In the end, they had peace, and he married the princess, if I recall the tale correctly. Trepidation almost caused Darcy's hands to shake. His cousin appeared far from finished. Richard continued. Do you recall our Latin studies at Cambridge? When Darcy nodded, he added, The golden legend told the story of the Virgin Martyr. What was her name? Saint, um... Darcy and Elizabeth replied at the same time. Saint Margaret of Antioch. Darcy was inordinately pleased with her intellect. Richard nodded, then added, Well, she too used the sign of the cross to rid herself of a massively fierce reptilian creature. Very Catholic of her, Elizabeth muttered. My point, if you two would pay attention, is... Richard peered at each of them with his brows lowered in mock frustration. There is only one way to slay Lady Catherine and Anne. And that would be... Darcy was curious, and he could see the same emotion in Elizabeth's eyes. Ah, you see, this is the brilliance of my scheme. Richard rubbed his hands together. If there is anything both Aunt and Anne know about you, Darcy, is that when your heart is involved, nothing, and I do mean nothing, can budge you from your attachment. Your love for Miss Elizabeth is so solid, so sound, nothing will divert you from your plans of pursuing her. Aunt Catherine, now she is aware, would retreat with her white flag waving, I'm sure. Darcy could not catch his breath. His chest was tight. Intense heat flooded his neck to his forehead, until he thought his hair might catch on fire. He was going to wring Richard's neck, or rip his tongue from his mouth, blast him to hell and back. Visions of every time his cousin had backed him into a corner flooded his mind as Darcy's hands of their own will reached for Richard's shoulder. Before his fingers could touch fabric, despite his brain's focus on acting out his most commanding desire, he heard her. You love me, she whispered. Nine. Most ardently, Darcy admitted, examining her face to see if he could read her response. She had caught him off guard so many times in Kent, it pleased him to no small degree to have finally done the same to her. For him, Richard and the maid ceased to exist. Elizabeth was his world. She dropped her eyes to her lap, where her fingers nervously picked at the fabric of her skirt. Her breathing was shallow, and her colour was high. Although they had been on the road for a short time, already a lone curl fought for freedom just behind her ear. He longed to reach across the carriage to touch it, twisting it between his fingers to see if it was as soft as he imagined it would be. Have you no response? He softly inquired, barely able to keep the air in his lungs coming in and out. Leaning forward, he willed her eyes to rise and look at him, for then he would be able to know her innermost feelings, her desires. Mr. Darcy, I... She glanced at him before again her eyes went to her skirt. Her fingers stilled as she smoothed the bunch fabric. Inhaling slowly, she lifted her chin, the corner of her lip between her teeth. I have never heard those words from a gentleman... In my wildest imaginations, I never envisioned them coming from you. Why? He had treated her poorly when they were in Hertfordshire. Their beginning in Kent was little better. His own vacillation between offering for her or not had kept him distant. He knew those things. Nevertheless, he desperately needed to hear from her own sweet mouth. If there was still a barrier existing between them, he could possibly break down. He needed to know if he had hope. "'Sir, I am without words,' she admitted bravely. "'In Hertfordshire, you often stared at me. "'To be honest, I suspected it was more a glare "'as you searched for the deficiencies I knew you would easily find. "'Within my hearing, you called me merely tolerable, "'with no ability to tempt a man of your stature.' "'When he started to make a rebuttal, she lifted her hand and stopped him.' You showed no joy for your close friend's happiness in discovering a lady without peer. When he shook his head, she blurted, You know I am correct. 
He nodded, tempted to intervene, but determined to keep quiet so he could listen. My family, our neighbours, and myself all concluded you were displeased with Meryton society. The only exception, as far as I observed, was the pleasure you took in avoiding Miss Bingley's attentions, as a chess master skilfully moves his king to avoid a pestilent pawn. Richard chuckled, while Darcy agreed. True. I was unable to guess what you were about. She paused to smooth her skirts again. Your intrusion on our party at the parsonage was quite unexpected. The things I learned about you from Colonel Fitzwilliam and yourself unsettled me until I was robbed of my sleep. Most telling to me was our conversation in the glen. I left wondering who is this man. Clasping her hands together, she brought them up under her chin. And then there is the matter of Mr. Wickham. Do you still have unanswered questions regarding any aspect of my decisions in regard to him? Darcy asked. I do not. The initial reaction of your cousin and the information you shared was enough for me to know I had judged him in error. Her lids closed as she gently shook her head. When she opened her eyes, she looked solely at him. Instead of being overly proud of my intellect, which I have been in the past, I am sorely ashamed of my ignorance, and I am distressed at the possibility I have in my cultivated prejudices misjudged others as well. Miss Elizabeth, I cannot allow you to continue in this manner, Darcy began, when Richard interrupted him. I can see where this conversation is going, and it needs to stop here. He was using his colonel voice. Rather than going back and forth explaining how wrong each of you were, and how you are both filled with regrets, might I suggest you focus on something of import? Darcy was incredulous. From the look on Elizabeth's face, she was too. I know, I know. As the son of Lord Matlock, I am aware fine manners would never step over someone else's conversation. However, as a soldier who has had multiple conferences prior to heading to the front lines, the need to get to the point without wasting time is imperative. Taking in a deep breath, he went right to the issue. Now, Miss Elizabeth, you know my cousin, with his thick block of wood for a brain, loves you. You, Miss Elizabeth, have admitted your surprise at the declaration. Now what? My question to you both is what are you going to do with this knowledge? Wickham is no longer important. Aunt Catherine and Anne are no longer important. Even the conduct of your younger sisters is not important to this question. Ignore me and... Uh... He waved at the maid. Sarah, Miss Elizabeth offered. Sarah. Richard nodded to the woman. Yes, as I was saying, you both can ignore our presence as you discuss your future, together. First and foremost, can you see a future with Miss Elizabeth? He asked Darcy. I can. Can you see a future with Darcy? His attention was now turned to Elizabeth. I... I do not know, she admitted, perplexed. That will do for now. Richard jabbed Darcy with his elbow. What you do from this point on, cousin, is woo her. Court her like the gentleman you are under your stiff exterior. Tease her, for I believe she enjoys being teased. Whisper words of affection pouring from your heart whenever you have opportunity. And most of all, become a man she can hold in respect and affection. If all else fails, kidnap her and take her to Pemberley to see your library. That, more than anything, should win the heart of this fair maiden. It started with a giggle. While Darcy struggled to find his words, Elizabeth's merriment grew. Before too many seconds passed, all of them joined in shared laughter. By the time the noise settled, Darcy had plotted his course. If Bingley allows me to remain at Netherfield Park, would you allow me to call on you, Miss Elizabeth? He offered, then held his breath until she responded. I would like to get to know you better, sir. She smiled. The radiance of her, the sheer beauty before him, stole his ability to inhale. They had not reached his goal, but they had a start. Despite the company in the carriage, he lifted her hand to his lips. Closing his eyes, the dream of Elizabeth filled him. He loved her with all of his heart and soul. She sighed. Richard kicked his dusty boots against Darcy's hessians, 
a move he had used in the carriage less than a week prior. I told you when we first arrived in Kent that I knew you'd fallen in love. Richard was smug. Let this be a lesson to you, cousin. You are an opened book, no matter how hard you try to hide your feelings from me. Colonel Fitzwilliam, I cannot believe your statement is entirely accurate, Elizabeth challenged. For I suspect the exact moment he realised his affection for me was deep. She looked to Darcy, continuing, was in the glen by the pond. Am I correct? He nodded, pleased she had noticed. Glancing back at his cousin, she added, I do not believe you were in the glen, were you? No, I do not believe I was, Richard admitted sheepishly. Then the book opened, and only I read what was written on the pages. Am I still correct? I imagine you are. Then, Mr. Darcy, I can think of one unattached lady of fortune who would simply adore a connection to the Darcy family through your relatives, the Fitzwilliams. She has opinions as strong as your cousin's, as well as an elevated view of her abilities at attaching and separating ladies and gentlemen to her pleasure. Should we see to an introduction? Darcy guffawed. Of whom are you speaking? Richard insisted, his curiosity aroused. Why, Miss Caroline Bingley, of course. She would be perfect for you, Elizabeth insisted. Never! Richard's voice reverberated around the inside of the carriage. Elizabeth and Darcy laughed together. Her eyes sparkled. She did not remove her hand from his. He loved this woman. He wanted her for his bride. He would be the happiest man on earth should she agree to a courtship. Should she agree to be his Elizabeth? Epilogue Years later, Darcy would have loved telling their four sons how easy his courtship had been with their mother, but it would not have been the truth. Mr. Bennet held on to a measure of resentment until the first time Mrs. Bennet convinced him to leave his study and travel to Pemberley. Once he walked into the estate's library, all aspects of a grudge departed, never to appear again. Mrs. Bennet, at first unwilling to see the unacceptable conduct of her young daughters as anything other than youthful hijinks, finally noticed Darcy's reluctance to spend any time in their company. When Elizabeth eventually accepted his offer of matrimony, and her mother learned his Fitzwilliam relatives would attend the wedding, she wanted nothing, not even Miss Kitty and Miss Lydia, to ruin the day. Under the threat of being banished to their rooms, instead of attending the wedding breakfast, they came up to scratch and behaved themselves. Mrs. Bennet considered the event her greatest triumph. Miss Mary and Miss Kitty married well. The youngest? She never lost her love for an officer's coat. Unfortunately, by the time her father declared her to be ready to mix in society, the war was over, the militia was long gone from Hertfordshire, and officers were a rare commodity. The man she wed was older than Darcy by several years, but, according to Miss Lydia, he wore his uniform well. Bingley's carriage had followed Darcy's to Hertfordshire the morning after they hurried to the gardener's residence that spring afternoon. Jane had already agreed to accompany Elizabeth home to Longbourn, so it was a merry group making the four-hour journey from London. His Elizabeth never made her trip to the Peaks and Lake District with her aunt and uncle. By midsummer of that year, she was happily ensconced at Pemberley as a new bride. The gardeners stayed with them for a month. Before winter set in, Bingley and Jane, wed in a double ceremony with the Darcys, had left the close environs of their mother-in-law's constant presence at Netherfield Park and had purchased an estate neighbouring the Darcys. Richard put up a good fight against Miss Bingley's machinations until he dodged one way and she did the other, only to meet in the middle in a very public embrace. Richard reluctantly proposed, and she eagerly accepted. However, within three months, a gentleman who would inherit an impoverished barony enticed her away from Darcy's cousin. The colonel's relief at being released from the engagement was such that he avoided fraternising with the fairer sex for years. In fact, at almost forty, he and his new wife were expecting their first child the next spring. Georgiana remained at Pemberley, her nephews were devoted to their Aunt Georgie, as she was equally committed to them. Lady Catherine de Bourgh and her daughter Anne refused to leave Rosings Park for any of the weddings or births. 
Despite Elizabeth sending invitations and announcements, they heard news of the two women from Lord Matlock. Darcy was unsurprised. He loved his life. The richness and fullness of living with Elizabeth and their family moved him to welcome each passing day with pleasure. She challenged him, and she tempted him beyond his imagination, which, under her tutelage, was vivid. Together they had built a strong foundation of trust and love. If asked, Elizabeth would tease and say she fell in love with Darcy when she saw Pemberley. Nonetheless, Darcy knew the truth. Their love grew from little steps, not a giant leap. Courtship had been his greatest fear. He suffered for thinking of ways he could please a woman worthy of being pleased. He even asked Richard for suggestions. Somehow he knew buying a new thoroughbred for a lady who would rather walk than ride would not win her heart. He had been right, and Elizabeth loved to taunt Richard with how wrong he had been with his recommendation once she was told. Together they had laughed. Other times they cried. Life, even on a bucolic estate like Pemberley, was ever-changing as the old passed away and the new emerged. They were building their heritage as each day he valued his wife more and more. Yes, he loved his life. He loved his children. But most of all, he loved his Elizabeth. The End This has been Elizabeth, a Pride and Prejudice novella, written by Christy Capps, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Copyright 2018 by Joy D. King. Production copyright by Quiet Mountain Press, LLC.